Now, I want to turn now to your most recent research, which you've done a lot about the, the truth of uh, domestic violence, which has become one of these uh, sacred cows in Australian politics. No mainstream Australian politician will dare question that there's a domestic violence uh, epidemic. But um, uh, through your uh, publications, you've said it's, you know, it's, it's not as straightforward as it's being made out. It's an issue that affects both uh, women uh, and men. Yes, well, I mean, certainly not my research. It's research. We've got 40 years of research showing that. There, there was a, a, a big compilation of all that research done a few years ago, which, which included 1,700 peer-reviewed papers, um, meta-analyses, you know, compilations of enormous amount of research uh, which shows that most domestic violence is two-way violence involving women as well as men it's not about respect for women it's not about dangerous men attacking women that is a minority of the a tiny proportion of the the cases of domestic violence that are actually witnessed and i mean it's the most fascinating area because if you ask men and women, particularly 10 years ago, when most the data started being collected in Australia, if you ask men and women who's a victim of violence, most men would say, no, I haven't been, because there was an enormous amount of shame associated with the idea of being beaten up by your wife or partner. Um, so you tend to get many more women saying they were victims than, than men. Then you ask, go out and ask men and women, who are the perpetrators? Have you ever hit anybody? Women will usually i mean often the, the research shows very clearly that women will in that circumstance acknowledge they do it as much as men if not more and researchers across the world have been gobsmacked by that really surprised to find young women women of all ages admitting that they've slugged a guy um i was watching you know that tv show that suits about the lawyers it's called Suits. i i was just being working my way, binging on that, watch, working my way through it. So far, I've got seven women who slapped men in the face. And it's treated as a great joke. And that was only made in the last few years. It's, it's just amazing how there's no censure whatsoever towards women abusing men. And yet we see it everywhere. Everybody knows it's happening. I, I mean, I've been writing, as you say, I've been writing about this for years now. I get letters all the time from women who, and men and women who say, I grew up with a violent mother, uh, my brother's wife is an ice addict. I mean, everybody knows there are violent women out there and we're not allowed to talk about them. And it's just shameful, the misinformation, the lies we are being told about domestic violence. I, I think this is one of the most shameful lies perpetrated by feminists, the, the fact that they've managed to absolutely capture the dialogue around domestic violence and totally control it. So we have, you know, everyone from Malcolm Turnbull down saying lie, domestic violence is all about respect for women. We have millions of dollars being spent on horrible ads depicting little boys as violent and little girls as eternally innocent. Everybody watching that ad knows it's ridiculous. And yet it goes on and we have this massive bureaucracies out there promoting misinformation about domestic violence and being paid for by us. You said at the beginning, Tim, that there's no one challenging this. Well, there is one person, which is David Lionhelm, who and we have to give enormous credit to the Senator Lionhelm. He's been in there at Senate Estimates, the committee, getting putting the bureaucrats on notice saying, what's the evidence for this ridiculous te television campaign? What's the evidence that domestic violence is all about, uh, you know, disrespect for women? Uh, he's been calling them out on their lies every time he goes before them. And I hope we'll next year manage to get some more people on board trying to do that. So is that where most of the money goes, uh, advertising and awareness? Because Oh, no. Most of the money goes into employing thousands of female bureaucrats whose jobs depend on this lie, whose whole job, you know, is about, you know, people running the right women campaigns, people running these, there's lots and lots of organisations which are all about domestic violence and their job is perpetrating, spreading propaganda, misinformation. 
and they're doing a brilliant job and boy are they a mighty industry to take on because I do read uh, some of the, the feminist uh, blogs and they, they, they always say if there's the slightest cut in, you know, funding to, you know, women's organisations, then, oh, we'll have to, you know, shut down a, a domestic violence shelter, we'll have to, you know, shut down a, a helpline. Yeah, as if. I mean, that's the thing. The, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that Malcolm Turnbull boasts about, hardly any of that is going to shelters. I mean... You, you can always argue more money needs to be there at the coal face, but most of it is going into people who are promoting misinformation. No question. I could give you the stats on that. And uh, one of the other issues you've um, spoken about uh, this year, and it's, it's a phenomenon that's um, confused me quite a bit, it's the university uh, rape epidemic, which it started off in the, the United States, there was that documentary, the, the Hunting Ground, but it's come to Australia with the uh, report released earlier this year by the um, Human Rights Commission about um, sexual harassment and assault on university campuses. Now this um, uh, study, it was so easy to like debunk, like I only looked at it for a few hours and I was able to, you know, pick out all the holes in it. But why has, uh, I, I want to ask you, why has the university like uh, become, you know, this, you know, battleground for, you know, uh, uh, this issue? I mean, um, you know, obviously university educated men are more likely to be on the, on the feminist side. So why do, you know, the feminist lobby, why do they pick on, you know, men who, who, who go to university? Well, it's a deliberate campaign. It's, it's right up there with the domestic violence campaign as a means of, um, you know, really, well, I'll tell you where it all comes from. It comes from the fact that the, there's an assumption by the feminists that we don't get enough rape convictions. And it is true, particularly in cases that are likely to occur on campus when you've got a young man and a woman, they're usually pissed. And it's a he says, she says. You know, he, he claim, she claims he didn't stop when she asked him to stop and he says, yeah, so on. And those cases won't get convicted in court. So if a woman go, accuses a man in that situation of rape, goes to court, our very sensible juries of ordinary people will turn around and say, oh, there's not enough evidence to put that man in jail. I'm not going to convict him, quite rightly. Um, oh, there's, you know, that there's this text she sent to him after the so-called rape where she said, I'd love to see you again. And they'll take into account all that stuff and they won't convict the guy. Um, so what the feminists decided they're not enough rape convictions, that's what this whole fake campus rape epidemic is all about, trying to get in these sexual consent cases, get, trying to get more convictions by taking it out of the hands of the criminal law system and putting it in the hands of, of judicial, you know, semi-judicial bodies. Like in America, they set up uh, tribunals across America. Obama, President Obama did that decreed that all publicly funded university had to have tribunals to try these men it was a totally different standard of proof uh, often where the men weren't even given details of the allegations who had no capacity to rep have lawyers represent them and now what's happening in america is the universities are on their knees fighting off hundreds literally hundreds of wrongful uh accus you know cases where boys, young men have been accused of rape and and thrown out of the universities and ended their education and now now being the families are now suing the universities for the fact that, that they didn't properly allow the, the due process to occur in those legal cases. Now that's exactly what they're trying to achieve here and the hilarious thing is they conned the Human Rights Commission into spending a million dollars of our money to try to prove there was a rape crisis on campus and they came up with nothing. Point, I can't remember what it was now, 0.7% of our Aussie students, female students, said they'd had some sort of sexual assault, not even on campus. It included travelling to and from from the uni with, with people who weren't even at the uni. It could include any incident involving a student with anybody else. That's the best they could come up with. 
absolute proof we don't have a great crisis on campus. And what are the universities and what does the media turn around and say, oh, well, there's a lot of sexual harassment, um, which turned out to be mainly staring. So girls who go along to uni in their gorgeous little short shorts or their minis or whatever it is, or um, get stared at, which is hardly surprising, and they object to it. I mean, come on, give me a break. But the fact that our universities, our vice chancellors are parading around, perpetuating the notion that there is this rape crisis on campus, putting off overseas students, you know, these the, the families in India and China and so on who are sending their kids to Australia, why would they send their kids to Australia if there really was a rape crisis on our campuses? I mean, it's all nonsensical. But it's just another example of where feminism, today's feminism, is leading us. And one of the places it's leading us in terms of universities is creating universities as unsafe places for young men where they're at risk of being wrongly accused of sexual assault. I've got a young man in a university in Australia who's fighting one of, one of these cases just in the last few months. He's got being required to appear before a student committee to answer rape charges. I mean, this is a criminal offence, and yet students are wandering around thinking that they can ask this guy questions about his behaviour on the basis of a supposed allegation. I mean, the whole thing is totally nuts. Uh, you touched on it uh, briefly about the uh, role of uh, fatherhood. Now, uh, obviously, the, the rights of fathers is... Uh, not well respected, well, uh, not just in Australia, but uh, anywhere in the uh, the West. The the family court is hugely biased uh, uh, against men, and there's you know been countless stories of men who uh, completely being cut off uh, uh, from uh, from contact from uh, their children, yet they're forced to pay these absorbent uh, child support. Um, uh, payments. Uh, how can the, this bias be be overcome? Because uh, there was a move during the Howard government to you know correct this uh, bias in the family uh, law system, but it, but it seems to be ingrained in the the culture of the family court that it's that, that it's men who are always starting from the losing position. Mm. I mean, I was in, very much involved in all of this in the Howard era, and on, funnily enough, I found myself on government committees representing men uh, because some of the Howard people were concerned that the way committees were structured, often the men from the men's groups weren't a good match for the really powerful women's groups. I mean, I've always been interested in this, the fact that people find it's very hard to get the really well-educated professional men to join men's groups uh, and fight for men's rights or father's rights or uh, because they tend to just fight their battles on their own paying expensive lawyers to do you know to go to family court for them they don't want to be associated with a bunch of losers i mean that to me this is one of the critical issues around not only family law issues but a whole range of men's rights issues is where are the part so-called powerful men who are running our society, why aren't they looking after men's rights? Uh, but in this case, I found myself on these committees trying to do something um, to represent men. I mean, we, I was on a committee to do with re reforming the child support formula. Uh, if you think it's bad now, you should have seen it before then uh, because there used to be no recognition whatsoever that it actually costs money to look after a child, even if you're a non-custodial parent, even if you have that child two days a week, you still need a bedroom. You still, and we, we actually work quite hard to try to adjust the formula to include some of those costs. You're never going to get it right. And of course, what inevitably happens is, um, it, you know, if there's uh, uh, money that kicks in when a man has a woman, has the kids stand, stay with them for two days a week, women will stop allowing the children to stay with him for two days a week uh, because that means she loses income. And I mean, it's just an enormously difficult area. Uh, and I agree about the, you know, it is right about the issue of <clears throat> um, men naturally being resentful of paying money for children they don't see. Um, and yet it, that's a very difficult relationship because, I mean, if you're not seeing your children, there's still your responsibility 
And if you want to have a relationship with your children, the best thing you can possibly do is be able to prove that you've always cared about them by continuing to support them and continuing to fight to be able to see them. Uh, but I spend half my life talking to men in that situation about the frust you know, enormous frustration of being unable to even talk to their kids, let alone spend real time to them. So th this whole area is a nightmare. I used to write about it all the time. It just, I find it so depressing. Um, and thousands and thousands of men who have written to me in that situation just break my heart. Um, I haven't totally given up and occasionally I go back to looking at family law issues when I get so furious about something that I can't resist. Um, but I mean, in so many ways, it got better for a while. John Howard made some significant changes. And then, of course, when Labor got in, the Labor won that all back. People listening to this need to know that the Labor Party is absolutely captured by the lone parent organisations, the lone mums, and they are never going to do anything to reform family law. Um, liberals have been shocking recently, um, but at least if you look at the history of our various political parties, within the Liberals are people who are genuinely concerned about this issue and want to do something about it. And we're just putting more, we need to put more pressure on them to get moving again, to shore up some of the advances that were made under previous Liberal governments. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.